Last week we talked from the Gospel of John chapter 6, and we covered passages from verses 60 to, um, uh, I believe, uh, 64, and uh, I'm sorry, 66, and today we are going to pick it up from there. Last time we talked about the difficulty in really following Jesus and believing in him, and today we're going to talk about those who will end up leaving Christ. I mean, the very statement, by the way, that some leaves Christ is a disturbing statement. How can you leave the one that gave his life for you? Today in my live stream, I have a gentleman who left Christ, followed Islam for 12 years, and then left Islam and recognized the one that saved him and came back to Christ. Those are the stories that I love. Today we're going to talk about those who have decided to abandon the one that saved him. John, in this passage, this is the conclusion, by the way, of chapter 6. Obviously, when John wrote it, he didn't write chapter 1, 2, 3, 4. But this is, in our Bible today, the way it's organized. This discourse, basically, has been concluded by the following passage. And I'm not going to read the whole thing, simply because in the interest of time, that you can follow along from verses 64 to 71. John, right now, is beginning to focus his attention on the ministry of Christ, going all the way to Judea and Jerusalem, and leading, of course, to the uh, crucifixion, obviously, and the resurrection. So, Jesus has been in Galilee he has demonstrated to those who are around him about himself, his work, his abilities, the miraculous things that he has been able to accomplish, the signs that they've been asking for that are more than convincing, but yet not everybody is satisfied. And it says that multitudes have been following him. And of course, uh, last chapter, he fed some of those multitudes and they continue to follow him because, like I mentioned last time, he is their perfect, holy vending machine. Whenever they're hungry, they can just stick a coin and get whatever they want. And Jesus can see this. You see, folks, people can say whatever they want. They can pretend however they want. They can show you stacks of Bibles on their shelf and stacks of notes and how many sermons they listen to, but the question is, do they believe in all of this? And when it comes down to it, are they going to be loyal to the one who called them? And I hate to say this, only during those testing times that things become clearer. Not everybody wants to follow Jesus. Everybody likes to follow Jesus. You know, we're in the times where we're using virtual, you know, approaches and online. I'm going to use some online language. They like to follow Jesus. They like to friend Jesus until something goes wrong. And that's what we're going to look at today. In verse 66, we're going to learn about the reason why people don't believe in Christ has to do with the false expectations. In verse 66, it says, after this, after what? After Jesus have already talked about, you know, eating his flesh and drinking his blood and the fact that he meant that it is the spirit that gives life and the fact that they began to realize Jesus is not whom they assumed him to be as this political Messiah. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. And folks, it is really interesting, the language that is used here. They didn't turn back and say, all right, we'll meet you tomorrow at the synagogue. Okay, that's fine. You know, we just really we were unable to comprehend what you're saying. It's been hot around here. We've been outside for too long. We can't focus. We'll see you next time. No, they turned their back and no longer walked with him. And the word walked here represents learning, experiencing, and getting to know him. They're no longer interested in this. They went to look for something different. 
they went back probably to the rabbis, the Pharisees, the scribes. The same people that Jesus earlier told them, search the books. For you think you have eternal life, but it testifies about me. The same people that didn't have a clue what the scripture is saying about Jesus, these multitudes and now some of the disciples who are learning from Christ, who have been following him for a while, decided to go back to these deceitful teachers, false teachers. You know how many people do this? You know how often people get into the church and all of a sudden they want to follow a false teacher because whatever this false teacher says tickles their ear. They want to hear what satisfies their fleshly desires. So, in social media language, some of those decided to unfriend Jesus, to unfollow him, and boy, some of them even blocked him. It's a terrible thing to do, isn't it, in social media? I mean, I see people sometimes complaining, so-and-so blocked me. I'm like, big deal. So what? But these people decided to do the same thing to the Savior. Why? Because the Messianic kingdom expectation did not fit their own. You see, they were waiting for the political Messiah coming on a white horse, with lots of soldiers and big army defeating the Romans and reestablishing the glory of the kingdom of Israel on earth. It will happen, but not in their timing, when they recognize that it wasn't going to be the way they expected it to be, they decided to leave. Now, isn't that interesting, folks? They got the message. They just didn't like it. Why would you leave unless you understood what the message that is being shared with you was all about? They just didn't like it. Unmet expectations. I love what Isaiah chapter 26 verse 3 says. You, speaking of the Lord, you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. You see... It's all about trusting in the Lord. You will feel peace about following if you trusted. If you knew this Lord that you are following. If you knew the one that has been feeding you eternal life. Not the one that they've been feeding you temporary stuff. No, the one who has been giving you eternal life. The one that told you plainly, I give you eternal life. I am the bread of life. If you come to me and believe, you will have that eternal life. They got it. They just didn't like it. You see, folks, there's a lot of false teachers out there that can persuade people to reject Jesus. Jesus anticipated this. He says, false Christ and false messiahs will arise and deceive, if possible, even the elect. You see how powerful Satan can be? Even those that are followers of Jesus, those who believed in him, those who understand whom he is, could be showing signs of willingness to be persuaded sometimes. Imagine those that haven't done that commitment. Islam, Mormonism, Jehovah Witness, Unitarianism, and the list can go on and on and on. There are isms everywhere. Question is, whom do you want to believe? Christ or just false teachers? And the scripture is filled with these warnings. I love what P.J. Temple says. He says, those who wanted a temporal king who would give them food for the body turned their backs on the king's son when he promised a banquet truly royal for the soul. They didn't want the royal banquet, the one that they will receive to spend all of eternity. They wanted just temporary stuff. And you know how many times people 
brag about, I know so-and-so, and I know so-and-so. Just give it the time, so-and-so will kick the bucket and die. But only Christ remains alive and continues to be alive and will always be alive and will give you eternal life. But we don't want Christ. We want so-and-so because temporarily we can do a lot because of the name of this guy or that gal or this organization or that. That's how the world operates. And sadly, there are many so-called believers and followers of Christ that fall into the same trap. Jesus knows. He's not surprised, by the way. Jesus is looking for loyalty and commitment. That's the second point. The first point why Jesus, people leave Christ and don't believe in him, false expectations, unmet expectations. But those who stick around are those who are committed and loyal. And Jesus asked the question in verse 67. So Jesus said to the 12, do you want to go away as well? What about you? Do you want to follow the same crowd that just left? Or are you willing to stay? The, the way Jesus asked the question is anticipating a negative answer saying, oh, no, we're not going anywhere. And rightfully so, that's how Peter responded. But you need to also uh, recognize the following. We started it with the multitude, the majority, and then it talks specifically about even a minority group called the disciples of Jesus. Both began to disperse and leave. And now we're left with the few. I love, by the way, the, uh, the, this uh, basically the remnant theology in the Bible. Jesus is always looking for just the few. He only cares about the few. God in the whole Bible used the few. Gideon's story is just an example. I mean, just imagine you are serving in the military and you come up with this Gideon plan. 300 to go against these tens of thousands. Yeah, I'd like to see you survive in your career in there. Ain't going to work. But it, with God, all things are possible. God always uses the few. He used the 12. 2,000 years ago, and look where we are today because of that. So Christ focuses on what? And I love the fact that John identified the 12. This is the first time, by the way, that this title was mentioned about the 12. And even the 12 will not stay 12 anyway. They will become the 11 for a temporary time. Why? Because one from within that inner circle will turn his back on Christ as well. Don't be surprised, folks. Don't be surprised that these things can happen from within, from within. But Jesus is demonstrating the fact that following him doesn't mean you are compulsed to do so. There is free will. What about you, he says? You want to stay or do you want to leave? You see, Jesus didn't come to give you two choices as I grew up believing. Believe or face fighting or even kill. That's how many worldly religions behave. Not so with Jesus. Do you want to follow me? If not, you're free to go. I'm not here to force you. In fact, it's better for you to leave because I don't need mediocre believers. I want genuine believers. I want committed believers. I want loyal believers. Folks, it is those believers why the history of the church thrived all the time. The few, the Tyndale, the Wycliffe, the Calvin, and the rest. Martin Luther, all these names that you hear all the time, it's the few that stood against the wave, the mainstream that God used. Just a martyr, Ignatius, and the list can go on and on. One name, I love it. It's one name. I'm sure there were more people than them, but they stick out. Why? Because they stood against this wave of opposition. That's the kind of people Jesus is looking for, loyal and committed. You know, he, he told us, come unto me, 
all you who labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. But you have to acknowledge, by the way, that you are burdened, that you're tired, that you cannot get it done on your own. You have to come to him. He is giving you the choice. He says, I'm, he didn't say, I'm going to pull you to come and follow me. No, he says, come unto me if you want, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am humble and meek, and you will have rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's the kind of stuff that Jesus teaches. But you know what the world wants? They want to go and follow legalistic systems. Do this, then do that. Do it this way. Dress up that way. We follow the order of worship this way. We only use the cup that way. You know how many times I get brain headache over all these kind of issues? And I'm like, really? I mean, that's amazing. Where did you get this from? It's man-made. We love man-made stuff. Why? Because we don't like the idea that it's light and it's not burdensome. There has to be something. Jesus must have meant it differently. We don't like to have rest to our souls. We like to burden our souls all the time. And that's why, sadly, the church in general will not survive against anything if we have this kind of mentality. Only when we stand up for the truth according to what Jesus taught, only when we show loyalty and commitment to Christ that nothing can befall us, nothing can intimidate us, nothing can harm you. And that's the kind of believers that Jesus is looking for. Another reason why Sometimes people cannot follow Christ or fall away from following him because they're not willing to confess him. They're not willing to have confidence in him and they're not able to comprehend him. However, this was demonstrated by Peter that they, the 12, were able to do all of this. They were able to confess him, have confidence in him, and comprehend him. He says, Simon Peter answered him, says, Lord, to whom shall we go? And I love this answer, by the way. You know what Simon Peter is saying? We've calculated everything. We know who are those teachers aside from you. We don't think they can do anything for us. Only you can. See, they did the math. They counted the cost. They understood what's it like to follow Jesus. This is the same Simon Peter, by the way, that always puts his foot in his mouth. The same Simon Peter. The same Simon Peter who says, we've left everything for you. Now he's recognizing that it wasn't a loss. As the Apostle Paul says, I count it all rubbish for the sake of knowing Christ my Lord. That's the kind of confession that Jesus was looking for. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. You see, he was listening. He was listening to the teaching of Christ. In the same chapter, that's what Jesus says. Yet the majority wanted to leave because they didn't like it. And the 12 understood. You have the word of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. And that's an incredible, by the way, confession by a Jew. To call Jesus the Holy One of God is equivalent to blasphemy. But yet he knew this is the chosen one of God. This is the one who is desecrated by God. This is the Lamb of God chosen by God to be our sacrifice. And he is the embodiment of the holiness of Yahweh. I'm looking at you right now. You are that one. In fact, the Jews always confess that Yahweh, God, is that holy one, and they are no basically naive when it comes to confessing these things and applying it to God. Yet this confession by Peter was only mentioned one more time. Guess by who? Demons confess Jesus to be the holy one of God. It's amazing, isn't it? 
Even demons knew who Jesus was, and yet people who are following Jesus missed it completely. You see, you have to have an intimate relationship with Jesus. The demons knew who he was because they were there and they became fallen angels. So they're terrified. They know he's coming to judge. But for us, you have to have that knowledge and intimate relationship with him to know him to be the Holy One of God, the true Israel, the one that God told Israel in Leviticus 19, uh, verse 2, be holy. For I am the Lord your God is holy. But only Jesus can fulfill this. In him, we are called holy brothers, by the way. Saints. I laugh at this, you know. The church in Corinth is called saints. And yet the rest of the story is trouble in the church and problems. There is no saints in there. But in God's eyes, you are a holy one. You are consecrated for him. You're chosen by him. He knows you're not perfect. He's going to fix you. You're still called saints, holy brothers, holy brothers and sisters. And this description, by the way, the holy one also was applied to Aaron, the high priest, was applied also by David, maybe of David initially, but in Psalm 16, it's a representation of a prophecy, messianic prophecy that Jesus fulfilled later. So all of this leads us to Christ, who is our high priest, who is our king jesus is that holy one the only one that is called this way literally fulfilling it in isaiah 48 17 you'll see what's going on here how this title is extremely powerful and how jesus's name just emanates out of it thus says the lord your redeemer the holy one of israel isn't that amazing only Christ can, can fulfill all of these titles. I am the Lord your God who teaches you to profit, who leads you in the way you should go. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Following him will provide everything that we need. Only he can lead us and we can follow. Now, another reason why people cannot follow Jesus or Stray away from him is betrayal. Turning their back on him, denying him. Now contrast this with Jesus that just been called the Holy One of God. In the next verse, in verse 20, John says, Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve, and yet one of you is a devil? In fact, you can say one of you is the devil. Folks, just as Jesus has his ministry and has his calling and has his good news, Satan has a competition going on at the same time. He has his own disciples. He has his own bad news message. And he wants to present a competitive option for people. And who do you think people tend to follow most of the time? Wide is the gate. Wide is the gate. Narrow is that gate that leads to eternal life. Wide is the one that leads to destruction. In the same confession, Peter just mentioned, the Lord is like, that's a good one, Peter. But let me remind you of something. I know what goes on in the hearts, even your heart. Because Peter, wink, wink, you're going to deny me pretty soon here. So don't flatter me, okay? Don't butter me up, Peter. Because one of you also will turn his back on me. Not just those who are in the outside, one of you from within. And John, of course, preceded by the Holy Spirit to identify that one, of course, telling you that was Judas Iscariot. Which is an interesting thing, by the way. If you look at the biography of Judas Iscariot in all of the four accounts of the gospel, he is identified as the betrayer. How would you like to have that in your bio, by the way? In your resume, I am known as the betrayer. You can trust me. <laughs> I got your back. That's a devastating thing, really, when Jesus identified that one of the 12, the inner circle, also will do even worse things than those. 
This is why it's really by grace and by the miracle of God that, that we are saved, folks. You know how many times we have the tendency just to leave Jesus and walk away from him? If it wasn't by his grace, by the power of the Holy Spirit to keep us attached to him, we'll all be gone. Do not underestimate the power of Satan, by the way. That's our problem. Sometimes we minimize what Satan can do. And here is a demonstration of the struggle between flesh and blood and the spiritual warfare. One of the twelve, Jesus says, is going to betray me, sell me out, literally. And you know what's so interesting? The same confession that Peter did here, you can almost look at the exact event in another gospel, even though it wasn't the same place. But Peter did make a confession like this before in Matthew chapter 16, starting from verse 13. They were at Caesarea Philippi looking basically at the view, at the rocks over there. And Jesus says, what do people say? Who do people say I am? And they start to tell him, oh, some says Elijah, some says one of the prophets. And Jesus looked at him and says, no, 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 time out. Who do you say? That I am. And Peter, of course, known as Big Mouth Peter, says, Oh, that's easy. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And once again, Jesus wasn't impressed. You see, good for you, Simon Peter. Flesh and blood did not teach you this, did not reveal this to you, but my Father who's in heaven revealed this to you. That was from verses 13 to verse 17. Fast forward, the same chapter, verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Uh-oh. Peter didn't like this. Verse 22. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Folks, this is a wrong sentence. To take Jesus aside and rebuke Jesus doesn't fit in the same sentence, okay? But that's what Peter did. Why? Satan kicks in immediately. You see, Satan doesn't want you to believe in the truth and the reality of what would it take for you to be a follower of Jesus. There is a cost that was paid to buy you. You were bought. You were bought by precious blood. You didn't shed your blood, but blood was shed for you. And Satan doesn't want you to know this. Doesn't want you to believe in it. He wants you to pretend that you can do it yourself. I grew up believing for years that I can go and blow myself up or kill myself, shed my own blood to earn my own salvation. And when I discovered Jesus did it for me, I'm like... Gee, can you imagine if I would have done that dumb idea before? I would have missed out. Do you see why the gospel is important for people to know? They need to know they have a choice. They need to know it was done for them. And Jesus is declaring that it's going to be done. So Peter takes Jesus aside and rebukes him. And Jesus immediately says, far be it. I mean, uh, that's what uh, Peter's saying. Far be it from me, Lord. This shall never happen to you. Yeah, we've heard it before from Peter. And then he denies him three times. And then the Lord says, he turned to Peter and says, get behind me, Satan. The devil has a competing gospel. We have to be mindful of this. Don't be surprised then that in the midst of ministry, you begin to see struggle and tension and fighting, and arguing, and division. Satan works there perfectly, just like he works outside the church. I was very naive when I accepted Christ, thinking that, wow, it's going to be amazing now working with believers versus working with worldly people. Everything will be fine. Amen. Amen. Everything will be fine. And then I got hit one after another by believer after believer after believer 
One such incident took place in 2011. I had to go to Pastor Roger's house and sit down, and he's looking at me in a classic way saying, just be quiet, be still, let God do his things. And I'm saying, did he just hear what I just said? <laughs> did he realize that I'm talking about another believer who did this to me? But he's seen it all. We're not perfect. We're not perfect. But that doesn't mean God cannot restore things. That doesn't mean we do not learn from one another. That doesn't mean we shouldn't forgive each other. No wonder these passages and commands are given to us because the Lord knows the heart of man. He didn't say nor knows the heart of evil men and sinners. No, the heart of man. Everybody. He knew the heart of Peter. Good for you, Peter. You're not going to butter me up with these statements because you are going to deny me three times. Peter was like, probably, thanks a lot, Lord. I wanted to be encouraged by you, but is this how you treat me? And later he denied the Lord, and he remembered that he denied the Lord, and remembered the word of the Lord, and he was devastated by it. The same Peter gave his, himself up for the Lord, went all the way to the cross himself. What changes the heart of man? Believe. And knowing Christ, when you know him intimately, nothing in this world worth it. Nothing. Ten years ago, Al-Fadi was a meek and weak and mediocre guy. Today, I can tell you, I've learned a thing or two not to care about threats or anything. I hope tomorrow I'll get even stronger. But what changed me? I didn't grow muscles. I'm actually getting weaker. It wasn't my good look. Just look at me. It is the power of Christ in me. It is acknowledging my weaknesses, knowing that I am, aside from him, I can do nothing. Growth and maturity allows you to stick with Christ and go the extra mile. But weakness comes from doubts, lack of obedience, and not willing to appreciate what Christ has done for you. I see that my time is up, so I apologize. Here is a couple of points of application, but really I encourage all of you folks, go and read Hebrews chapter 3. It speaks perfectly for how the Israelites grumbled in the wilderness for 40 years and how they denied the one who saved them, the one who fed them, and wanted to actually go back to Egypt to slavery, so they can eat rice and onion. Wow. They wanted to be slaves. They thought it was easier that way. That's what people do. They leave Christ to go back to become slaves to Satan. That's what people like. So what do we learn from this? Grumbling is a universal dilemma, okay? It happened in the wilderness, it happened in the New Testament, it continues to happen, and it will always continue to happen. Yes, even among believers. It is a testing of God and his patience. It is a lack of faith of God, lack of patience waiting upon him, an act of disobedience and betrayal to him, and it's truly a denial that God is in our presence. That's what grumbling means. And I hope that none of us really stick to that plan. We ought to learn from it. This is why discipleship becomes important. That's why accountability is important. That's why the church is extremely important for all of us. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. We thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for your Holy Spirit to enlighten us and open our minds and hearts to know you, Lord. Father, Help us to continue to grow in our walk with you, in our knowledge of you, and help our unbelief, Lord. We ask all of this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.